Archives 101. As Kip said, this has kind of come about because so many people do ask, what do you do? I'm an archivist. What's an archivist? Well, so these are the questions we're going to answer, and I know most of you are probably more familiar with these things than our general public, uh, because I see a lot of our volunteers and board members in the room. <laughs> so you know what we're talking about, but this is, you know, the quick and easy. I'm going to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to clip it to here. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm just starting Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In a theater, I, have, I don't have boundaries sometimes. No, that's okay, and I can't project very well, so. <laughs> Mic me up. There. There we go. Is that better? No, yeah, yeah, can hear me. Too Wonderful. Hard. <laughs> good. All right. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Anyway, we're here to just really get down to the very, very basics of what we are and what we do and how we do it. So, what are archives? I've got a lot of definitions here, which I know are super boring, but they come from the Society of American Archivists, which is sort of our the United States standards um, developers. So they make all this stuff up, we just kind of toe the line. Um, archives are materials created or received by a person, family, or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs and preserved because of the enduring value contained in the information or as evidence of the functions and responsibilities of their creator especially those materials maintained using the pr principles of provenance, original order, and collective control. Permanent records. So, um, it's an organization also, sorry, archives are a building, <laughs> and an organization that collects the records of individuals, families, or other organizations. So types of archival organizations include government archives, which we are here, universities have archives, medical organizations have archives, corporations, historical societies, uh, museums, even religious orders have archives. So these are all different types of collecting institutions. So here, as I said, we're a government archive, we have a mission statement. And our mission is to be the official repository of all non-current government records of Abe Silver Bow. So we are to acquire, maintain, and preserve historical documents, photographs, and manuscripts pertaining to Butte Silver Bow history, to provide the public, mm, public access to the document, manuscript, and photograph collections at the archives, and to work with educators to enhance the classroom experience, and to provide access to the documentation of this historic landmark district. Um, so really, primarily, we're here to be the place that keeps the government records, um, of Butte Silver Bow, and we keep them as evidence of the functions and responsibilities of the various departments of the city county. So we're also here to collect documents of enduring value to our history. Like these are our things that are from definitions of the archives, and this is what's in our mission statement. So, and also to provide access to these things. We don't just put them in the vault and nobody can ever see them again. We want people to get into them. We want people to research here. So, this is what we have, very generally, it's a very broad scope of collections. Um, so beyond our mandate to hold non-current government record, we also have uh, things that document the history of the second industrial revolution, uh, the history of copper mining, and the history of the Western labor movement. We try and have things that uh, display the ethnic diversity of views. Um, so this is, like I said, a really broad policy. Uh, we provide essential information on a number of subjects in the American West, <laughs> including the history of technology, political history, environmental history, the history of women and minority groups, and labor history. So really, pretty much everything. As long as it's related to Butte in some way, we want it. So what is an archivist? <laughs> um, let's see. An archivist is not a historian for the most part. You know, Kim said that we do a lot of history work, but in professional practice, 
there is differentiation between different types of information professionals. So an archivist collects, preserves, and makes historical records accessible with a minimum of intervention and interpretation. We're here to make sure it is secure and to make sure people can get into it, but it's not our job to tell you what it means. Uh, a historian, on the other hand, utilizes the historical records that our archivists here are preserving, um, and they analyze and interpret historical documentation, data, and primary record sources, and hopefully make those findings available to you in the form of histories, articles, and such. So, an archivist is not a historian. Archivists and librarians. <laughs> Ellen Crane, our lovely director. Um, an archivist collects, preserves, and makes historical records accessible using professional standards and practices. A librarian collects, preserves, and makes published materials accessible using professional standards and practices. So we both use professional standards and practices. This is not in question. It's the types of materials that we handle. Archivists primarily handle unpublished materials. Obviously, there's some overlap. We have a library here <laughs> with viewed stuff in it. But librarians are mostly concerned with things that are published. They have ISBNs and uh, Library of Congress and cataloging information in them, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> so an archivist is also not a curator. <laughs> no, that was Harry. Harry left that in. Harry, have some words with Harry. <laughs> so, an archivist is not a museum curator. Um, an archivist makes records accessible. The records might be paper, film, or electronic format, but they're all records. And a curator makes artifacts and objects accessible, mostly. That is what they do. Obviously, there's some overlap in all of these professions. We try not to step on each other's toes, but the archives ends up with things sometimes, and the museum ends up with things like <laughs> photographs sometimes. So there is some overlap. But in general, records, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I don't know. I really like this last image, actually, as a sort of D demonstrating the overlap. This is a picture of the first archivist of the United States receiving the film canisters for Gone with the Wind. Um, so this is a historical record of a thing, right? It's all of the original film, but it's also an artifact. Like this is a major motion picture that was made in the United States. There's a lot of things that went into it. It's an artifact, but the archives is taking it. So overlap, yeah? <laughs> what archives hold those? The U.S. National Archives. Yes. So, what are archival records? I just talked really a lot about how archivists handle the records. Um, so now I think I should probably tell you what we consider records. And these are some more very boring definitions. Um, records, materials created or received by a person, family, or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs. So business records, family papers, government records. So this is very a very simple definition, but to be a usable record, something has to be retrievable. So you can write it down all you want. That's great. If nobody can ever find it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's in your head. If it's a memory, it's a personal record, sure. If you can retrieve it, maybe you've forgotten. It's gone forever. Uh, <laughs> but a memory is not a record until it is communicated and retrievable. So here, we deal with local government records. And I'm not going to give you a written definition of that, but they're public records created or received by the <coughs> county, town, or district, smaller than a state. So at the Butte Silverville Public Archives, where our primary mission is to collect the non-current record of Butte Silverville County, this is what we take <laughs> from the county. You know something that begins with Z, so you gotta read this. Well, I mean, East Court is as close as we got. We got a zoo, I guess. We got a Y. A zoo. Get a Y. Okay, get on that, Jim. You get on that. You'd be like a zoo, I guess. So these are the departments and committees um, and boards of the Butte Silver Boat Public Archives as listed on the government website. This is everything that we collect the non-current record for. So 
difference between active and current records. And not current records. Active records are records that continue to be used with sufficient frequency to justify keeping them in the office of creation. Active records, so like at your school, they log daily attendance for each student, right? Those are current records. They're in use all the time. Um, a non-current record is records that are no longer used in the day-to-day -day course of business, but which may be preserved and occasionally used for legal, historical, or operational purposes. So when these students are no longer in school, if you take their records, you don't need them in the office anymore. You're not logging their daily attendance. But if you take them and bring them to the archives, at some point, somebody might use them for research, statistics. In 1957, how many children didn't come to school more than five days a year? I don't know why you would want to know that, but you might want to know that someday. Health studies. Sure. You could do a health study. You could do a health study. Absenteeism. Right. So these are things that are no longer used day to day, but might still be useful to someone at some point for something. So archival records. And you'll notice that this definition is really very similar to the general definition of the archives. Um, so materials created or received by a person, a family or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs, they're preserved because of their enduring value and they contain evidence of the functions and responsibilities of their creator. This is almost identical to the first definition that we had. So archives and archival records, they're like this, very much synonymous. Um, but what this means for us, uh, particularly for our government record, is that the records we keep are identified as having that enduring value. They're important to somebody for something at some point. We can see how they might be anyway. Um, and they're evidence of the functions and responsibilities of their creator. So this is the government record. You want to have evidence of what your democratically elected <laughs> officials are doing. If you want to go in and say, these are all pub you know, public records. If you want to say, what was the council minutes from 10 years ago? You can come here and look for that. So these are important things, archival records. So how do we do it? <laughs> It's a big question, right? I just show you that huge list of all of the different government departments that we deal with. And also, all of our public. So we have people come in at least a couple times a week and say, I have this thing. It's really kind of cool and historical. What do I do with it? I don't want it anymore. We take it. Yes, we will. <laughs> Why, yes, we will. So in addition to that big list of government departments, we also take pretty much anything else that anyone cares to bring us. Except artifacts, don't bring us Not artifacts. artifacts. Print Ellen, it. Ellen gets angry. Yeah. <laughs> bring well, those to the museum. <laughs> and we send them to the museum. Yes. <laughs> the laundry carts. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're going to talk about how we accomplish all these things. We're doing that with archival processes. So very exciting. Appraisal. The process of identifying materials offered to an archive that have sufficient value to be accessioned. So, you bring us your stuff, your old historical stuff that you don't really want anymore, and we take it in and we look at it and we say, do we think this could be of enduring value? Is somebody somewhere at some point going to want to look at this thing <coughs> or something? The answer is yes. We send you a deed of gift, and the back of that has, that's the back of our deed of gift form, it has conditions of donation. So this is, accessioning is the legal process by which you donate your things to us and we say, yes, we'll take them, but we get to have all of the rights. So you give them to us, you don't get any say anymore. <laughs> Unless we have the conversation beforehead and then maybe we'll work something out. But this is the basic process. Yes. So, appraisal and accessioning. We do this constantly with all of the things that come in, even the government record. So government records all have retention schedules. Some of the stuff we can elect to keep beyond their retention. So just depends on what we're getting. So preservation and conservation. This is the professional discipline of protecting materials by minimizing chemical and physical deterioration and damage to minimize the loss of information to extend the life of cultural property. So the act of keeping from harm, injury, decay, or destruction, especially through non-invasive treatment. So
So this is our preservation that we do here. Um, you'll see here some archival supplies up in the corner there. See some of our boxes and folders. These are acid and lignin free. They make it so that especially acidified documents that don't continue to deteriorate once we get them. These are all archival boxes in our climate controlled vaults. This is very important. It keeps things at the ideal humidity and temperature for paper. And down here, this is a little bit of conservation stuff. We don't do a lot of conservation work here. We just don't have the equipment, but we do do things like freezing documents that have mold and cleaning off dirt, <laughs> sometimes mending. It's very exciting, <laughs> um, but mostly we stick to the non-invasive treatments because even sometimes deterioration provides some context for whatever you're looking at. So, you know, we keep it to a minimum. And then once everything is kind of made stable um, and put in these archival containers and in our climate controlled vaults, we do this process of arrangement. So this is how we get from this big mess that we appraised to these lovely neat boxes on the shelf. And it's how we take the information contained in the collections and organize it in a way that we can put it in a catalog record and make sure people can get into it. So this is our arrangement process. It's difficult sometimes. <laughs> people bring things to you in chaos. Um, and you have to figure out if you need to maintain some chaos to maintain some context or if you should try and put things in an order that might have been organic to what they dumped on you. So sometimes things like chronology are really great to figure out. Just put things in chronological order, sometimes alphabetical order, sometimes a combination of the two. We try and respect the original order of collections that come to us because it provides important context for a lot of things. But sometimes this is the original order and it's loose papers of all different sorts just piled into boxes. And then we got some work to do. Um, so we do intellectual arrangement, which is what you see on that side there with the lovely little branches, and physical arrangement. They're not mutually exclusive, sometimes they're the same which is lovely if all the things in a collection are the same format. Everything is lovely eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. They fit perfectly in folders. This might be the same. If you have something that comes in with lovely eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper and dozens of photographs and some audio tapes, maybe a vinyl record, these things have different needs. So we've put them in different types of containers. But in our intellectual arrangement, we make sure that everything still is interrelated to one another. So, arrangement, lovely. Dan's in the house. Harriet oh, made us yeah. leave this. <laughs> so this is an example. I we just talked about our collections. <laughs> so each individual collection that comes to the archives is called a Fonz. Lovely illustrative picture there. Um, but this is an example that Harriet put together for our volunteer training we had a couple weeks ago, and we liked it really well, so we left it in. <laughs> so this is the Dan Peters collection, um, part of it anyway, I suppose. And this is Dan, a photograph of the principal. Uh, this is also Dan, the tall one, <laughs> in the Smithers picture. And then an uh, annual from the University of Montana where he played football, and the Silver Bees homecoming scrapbook. So these are all part of Dan's collection. So and the really important thing about this is that it stays a collection. So right now we have information about his childhood. We have information about um, his football career and how he was the principal of U High and uh, how he played football for the University of Montana. <laughs> so these things are all in the collection right now and they have meaning. And then if we decide that, oh, hey, you know what? That's a Smithers picture. We have a Smithers collection. Maybe that should go in the Smithers collection, that would make sense, right? Does that make sense? Sure it does. Let me take that out. <laughs> you get help. So we took that out. And now there's just a few things left in here. But you know what? This is the Butte Silver Boat Public Archives. We don't collect things from Missoula. We don't need that. We don't want that. That's not part of our mission. It's not important. Oh. <laughs> So now we have a couple things left in the collection. This is really great. 
But you know what? We have a Silver Beast collection. We have a whole collection of these Silver Beast scrapbooks. We can just move that into that collection and it'll be great in there, right? It's part of the series. All goes together. So now we just have Dan. <laughs> and Dan's a great guy, right? He's a volunteer here. Well, a lot of people don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I know we have, we have information about Dan the principal, and that's not unimportant, right? But we've lost all the context of his history. We don't have any information about other things that Dan has done besides being the principal of Butte High School, right? He's tragic, Jim, I know. <laughs> is he going to disappear? We have no, no he's not going to disappear. This is it. This is left. That's this is what's left. The box? That's all that's left. So the box ended up just being now a folder instead one of the box. One picture of Dan. Yes, that's all that's left. Oh. <laughs> but, so, but, 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 I don't know. This kind of, uh, but this is, this is why, this is what we don't do. Why we don't do that <laughs> yeah. is because we've just lost all of the context of Dan's collection. He might well disappear. His essence. He's not going to disappear, Jim. We're going to keep oh, him. We, we should have pixelated him. We so. should have pixelated him. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, this is, this is why it's important that we collect things in collections and what we take in a collection stays in a collection. Right? This is very important to us. So now, we have our lovely collections. And we want people to be able to access them, to get information about what we have, to get information about things that they're interested in. We do this through our cataloging process. And this is the standard that we use. So there's that SAA local down there, the Society of American Archivists. This is the Describing Archives Content Standard. So this makes sure that we put into our catalog records standardized fields, things about the title of the collection, the dates of the collection, how much of it there is, um, who it's about, you get some bio biographical information, either from the place that the collection's about or who donated it to us. These are all important things that we document. We have chain of custody, we have um, descriptions about the material, we have subject access. So if you're looking for things on football, for example, you can look in our catalog and come up with all of the things that we have that mention football. So this is our process. We use a standard, we put the information in a catalog record. The catalog records then appear online, which Kim will show you later. Um, and that's how we provide access to our public, which is a big part of our mission. So now, Kim, oh, if you wanna come on up, she's gonna do the fun part. She's gonna talk about what we have. Okay, Clark, can I just ask you a question? Like with the Butte Silver Bowl Council meets, at what point do their records become non-current? So that you would have to ask Nicole. She has the retention schedules for every department. She is our government record specialist here at Butte Silver Bowl Archives, our deputy director, Nicole ivankovich Kafelda. So she actually has all of those things. So she knows when things are scheduled to come here, she goes and gets them oftentimes instead of people bringing them here. Um, I'm not sure what the retention on councilman yeah, is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they are, but we will be doing, Nicole will be doing a government do record one. All on sometime. the government record. So, yes. So yeah, I don't have those schedules either written down with me or in my head. <laughs> okay, and then one, one more thing about, if you go to the courthouse, you can get like birth certificates, marriage certificates, probably death certificates too. Do you have a duplicate here? How does that work with the courthouse? We do have a duplicate. Those are not actually, we don't provide those copies until 72 and a half years. For after, birth certificates. For birth certificates. So there are. And they're not certified legal, legal copies. Right. So you can't use, the, you can only use them for genealogical purposes here. You can't use them to uh, renew your passport or for your driver's license or anything like that. So they're not certified, but they're really cool and they've got some great information. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, we have a library. Now our library is very special. We are not a lending library. Most of the books, well, I shouldn't say most of them, a lot of the books in our library um, have to have been produced using the resources in our facility. Um, in our library, we have city directories. Do we remember to pull a city directory? We did. We have city directories. 
City directories are kind of like phone books before people had telephones, and they have an alphabetical listing of everybody who lived in Butte, or all the households in Butte, anyway. Very, very helpful information, because they also tell you where they worked and where they lived. Um, at the beginning of the book, they tell you all kinds of things and are miscellaneous information about the government. So we had somebody in here the other day who was trying to compile a list of all of the jailers. And we're thinking, how do we do this? And we're pulling all kinds of stuff. And I went, of course, I'll go to the city directory because it will list all the people for this year. This is 1900. It will list all of the city departments and who works for them. So we were, he was able to just go through, find that page in each year, and take a picture of it so he can compile his list, which then he'll give to me, and I'll put it in the vertical file. Because that's kind of my little kingdom, is the vertical file. We have high school annuals. So don't worry, we bought the maroon, and we bought the bulldog, 1957. And look who's in here. Jim Ugrin. One, one of my gems is in here, right up here. Isn't, isn't me. That's not you? No. I was like, gosh, it, it, it kind of doesn't look, look like you. Look at 57 Maroon, you'll find me. Are you in that one? I thought you went to this one. Why are, there's two of you compare, in town? Compare the pictures. There are two Jim Ugrins? That's kind of scary. And not related. <laughs> and you're not related? Nope. That's weird. Mm -hmm. All right, where are you? P, P T, there, you're not in here. Were you 50, class of 57? 57? No, it's class 59. Oh, well, then I don't have you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't do individual photos oh, they for the did other group classes. Photos, that's right. They did that group photos. Back in the olden days. So too. look at the song. <laughs> the olden days. So, um, you know, a lot of people come, you know, if they're doing their reunion, they come, they track people down, you know, they'll scan people, to take funny pictures. Uh, a few years ago, our babysitter, at the time, I was a teenager, and I said, come here, we'll find your dad. And uh, he's a couple years younger than me, so he had the full-on mullet going on from the <laughs> 80s. It was awesome. So, uh, so we have yearbooks. We have published works, and we also keep our newspapers in there. Let's see, what else do we have? Vertical files, my kingdom. So in the vertical files, we have architectural inventories. These were done uh, by the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, almost all states will, will have these on record. We're lucky that we have them on record here in town. So this is an inventory that was done, um, an architectural inventory that was done in the 80s um, when they were really firming up the historic district in Butte. So, and this is in preparation. You always do this in preparation before you list something in the National Register. So you have your physical description here, and then on the back, section eight, is your historical significance. And they're helpful too, because a lot of these have like who the original owner was, how we know that information, what we checked. There's a good description of everything. So we have everything by, this is Henry Street. We have all the streets of town uh, and a few on the flats. And no, everything north of Front Street we have um, for hopefully every building that was standing in the 80s in preparation and whether it was a contributing structure. So we also have um, biographies. So William Clark actually has four folders. So I have his biographical information. I have information on his estate and how his will was probated. We have um, information about his holdings and properties, anecdotes about William uh, Andrews Clark, and uh, oh, and I also have one. I picked up Sweet Dahlberg too because I figured y'all would know him. <laughs> so we put our little catalog record in there, and things that are in here are newspaper articles and clippings, and these might have been gathered in the 70s or something. 
And then if I'm running across something, doing research, or here it is, or something, we'll print something off. You know, maybe we're printing it off to send somebody, so we'll put another copy in here. Or, oh, I had to look this up, so I'm going to stick it in that, that vertical file. So this is kind of an introduction to, um, to the history of Butte. The first thing, if you're looking something up, come here. Um, I want the history of uh, St. Mary's School. All right, we'll go to schools. And then we'll look in the Catholic section, and then we'll go to St. Mary's. Um, so we have, I've got too many papers up here now. So I have a list of topics that somebody came up with, I don't know when, but we have architecture, we have arts and humanities, so we have folders on um, films that were made here, musicians who might have played here, um, poets who came from Butte, and their poetry, writers, um, bars is a popular one, bars, breweries, roadhouses, and then we have an alphabetical listing, like if, um, if I've collected information on a bar, like um, we just collected, one of my researchers, Julie, who's back here, um, just collected information on the Columbia Bar. I was thinking of another bar yesterday, too. The Columbia Bar. We didn't have anything in the vertical file on that, so now we have not only the Columbia Bar, but the whole biography of the owner in a certain time. So that'll go in there and will be the next vertical file. So that's kind of how we build them. They're not things that we go out and go, oh, we need this. Um, and sometimes it's surprising what we don't have. Somebody, we got a research request for um, John C.C. C. Thornton. And I thought, oh, is that like the Thornton Building or what? I went, oh, the Thornton Building wasn't really named after him. Well, it was named after his estate, his daughter. The Thornton Building sits on the Thornton Estate and got into the smokehouse mine. We had no vertical file on him, but somebody requested all this information. So now we're going to have a vertical file on him for the next time. And that's why we have one. Well, that's not the only reason why we have one on W. Clark, uh, William A. Clark. Um, so anything that we come across, you know, we just put it in there. We have ethnic histories, we have schools, we have the churches, we have the police department, um, we have a section on, on murders, um, and sometimes like the unsolved murders, they'll come and they'll, they'll look through to, re you know, remember, okay, what did we read in the newspapers at the time? So, um, so you can tell that's my favorite thing. The other part of the vertical files is um, academic works. So those are going to be things like articles that appear in Montana Magazine, um, scholarly dissertations and thesis. This is a dissertation. So in our library, this is a really good thing to talk about. So this is all the same work, actually, as Brian Leach was doing research in Butte, he was creating articles and writing articles. So Montana Magazine said, would you write an article for us? Um, so he has several academic articles in there, in our vertical file. And uh, then he produced his dissertation, which he sent to us, and I cataloged. And uh, fascinating, I fell in love with it. And that was in 2013. And then in, I think it's 2017, 2018, the book came out. So this is a really good example of not only the things that we keep in our library and in our archive, but this was produced from the information in our archive. And um, now he did it all, and y'all don't have to go and look it up on your own. So that's one of my favorite things, too. Um, let me see, where's my whole thing? Manuscript collections. Diaries, ledgers, minutes, abstracts, correspondence, organizational records, um, the revised ordinances of the city of Butte for 1914. That sits in our library, so that's real interesting. If anybody wanted to index something like this, that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. Right now you just have to read it all. <laughs> um, 
Another one of my favorite things that we that we keep is not our government record, but it's very valuable. It's related to mining in Butte. It is the annual report of the Inspector of Mines of the state of Montana. So this is a description of every mine operating in the state of Montana in 1902. Um, each year they kind of did it a little differently. So this one I actually marked where to find Butte in here. And uh, he talks about the different companies that operated here. There's pictures. He talks about how many men died in the state in the mines, mining accidents, how many were injured. Um, so if you're looking for a description of the mine, like how deep was it? How many men worked there? Like, let me see, who was the foreman? Let me get past the pictures here. The Alice, owned and operated by Alice Gold and Silver Mining Company, employs 50 men underground and three top men. The main shaft is down 1,500 feet and has three compartments, a Fraser and Chalmers 18 by 18 cylinder engine and flat steel rope, uh, one or I, two by four, one and two by four inches. So that's a really great description of the mines that operated here in Butte. A lot of great technical information. So that's some of the information How many years that we hold. We have from 1889 to 1912. And I don't know if maybe uh, Montana Tech Library has more. I hope they do. Um, that would be awesome if they did. Um, Non-textual records. <laughs> Print photographs, film negatives, video, and oral histories. So here's what we do with those piles and envelopes of loose photos. We put them in these really neat boxes so that they lay flat and can be stacked up. So they're in, the, in these binders. Sometimes it'll hold the whole collection. Sometimes one collection will take up several boxes. See, we can just put them in here, and this is why I'm not wearing gloves, Jim, because I can touch the plastic. We do wear gloves when we are touching negatives, film, um, and objects. Uh, so you can just see, and then here's some negatives as well. We may, might, may or may not scan those, depending on how valuable we think they are and really how much time we have, because we have a lot of stuff. We do have a lot of stuff. Uh, ah! And my favorite, you all know how much I love maps. You know what the sample and maps are. Uh, topographic maps, plat maps, mining claim maps, architectural drawings, and schematics. So a lot of people give us things, objects. Um, like I said, we, we prefer that the museum. Um, and for the, we keep talking about the museum and looking over here, because we have uh, uh, Lindsay Mulcahy is the museum cur curator of the mining museum. So that's why I keep, we keep pointing at Lindsay when we go to the museum. <laughs> um, say somebody gives us an object and they think it's really cool and it could be a map or it could be a cup or it could be anything and they think maybe it would look great in an exhibit, which is fine. Maybe we'll use it in, as an exhibit someday. So we got this really cool map. Do you recognize this, Jim? Jim Yergren donated this to us. And where is my other little note? This proved to be one of the most valuable resources, there it is, of one of our projects that we're working on. So we got a grant this year to do a, uh, uh, to help improve Jutsurabo's county road base, especially for emergency E911 response, as well as other purposes. We use maps and I mean they need a, a, a good database for all the roads um, for many reasons. So one of the main resources that they used, they said, I think Ellen said in a meeting, we need an old map of Silverville County. And I said, well, wait a minute, we just got one in in the last few months. And so we have this map that Jim Yeager gave us. And it is an 1897 map of Silverboro County. And what makes this map so awesome 
is the amount of detail that is on here. It shows school districts. It shows little tiny towns that you know, we've never heard of, little tiny roads that we've never heard of. Um, what else does it I mean, just all kinds of boundaries, roads, districts, um, geographical features and creeks. They can take this and overlay it with a satellite map. And the satellite map now makes more sense. Because, you know, there might be something you don't recognize and you go, I don't know what that little shaded area is in there. And you look at this map and you go, oh, well, there used to be a road there. That's a road right there. Or, oh, there used to be a mining camp up there. So they said this, this was like the single most valuable thing that they got. So when you give us things and we process them, we process them so that we can find them. When you give us this, these things, just because you don't see them out in an exhibit or something, doesn't mean, or you don't see them in the library, doesn't mean that they're not being used because this ended up being like an incredibly valuable resource. So I was really surprised. I said, just write a couple lines. And he wrote me like two paragraphs about how wonderful this, this item was that they donated. So that is kind of points to the importance of um, the work that we do. And then, of course, we talked about the government record. We keep immigration records, birth and death records, coroner's reports, property tax records, school census. Um, actually, I've got a naturalization record here. Um, so we can track, you know, the people, we have people coming from all over the world to come and look at our immigration records. Um, so we keep the records of the second district court here. We have, here's another good thing. This is what a lot of our record looks like. This is a small one. Some of these books that we have are this bit, I'm not exaggerating, right, Jim? <laughs> the, the um, you know, my great-great-grandfather was here in 1919. What mine did he work in? Well, we've got a great big corduroy-bound leather book that we can go and find his employee numbers in there and find exactly which mines he worked in at which months in certain years. Sadly, it's only for a few years that we have that. So just some really amazing things. This is new. <laughs> That's why I keep filling around with it. Did I get it? There. Who uses the archives? The government uses it to store their stuff. But they also call on us and they say, can you go get a court case? Here's the number. Here's the person. Here's the year. And they were in this court. You know, the judge needs to see it. So they use us. Local organizations and service clubs, not only to come and do research, but maybe they've, they no longer exist. Um, so they, they donate their, their records. These are from the, uh, I think from the Junior League, is that right? These are Junior League, junior league records. These are all photographs. See, there's some of the activities that they um, undertook. So now we have a record of the Junior League and the activities that they did in Butte. Um, academics and geologists. These, this is a directory of the um, Stope books that we have. The Stopes are the literally the mappings of the mines. Um, we don't take rocks. You can have the rocks. <laughs> They'll take the rocks. <laughs> But we'll take the pictures of the rocks. And, um, but we do have a lot of, you know, if we have geological information that comes our way. Some of it might be more appropriate up at Tech. Tech might send some of it down to us. We're all good at sharing and making sure that the right information goes to the right place. But we do get a lot of geologists come in. Individual researchers. Um, is this under students, too? No. Researchers. Um, middle schoolers, um, kids who are in the Butte History Club or taking Butte History with Fisk, so high school, um, college students, graduate students. As you, most of you who come to this know, I'm doing my thesis based on the information 
um, here in our facility. Um, Postgrads, academics, people like Brian Leach who do their dissertations and then write books. Michael Punk, professor at U of M who wrote Fire and Brimstone. Uh, so all kinds of individuals. Um, people come from all over the world, genealogists, people on vacation, tourists come in and they, they're just like, we've never been to an archive, but the people down at the, um, at the uh, visitor center said we needed to come. And sometimes they're, they're, they don't know quite why they're here, but they love it once they get here. Because we love giving tours. So our staff, Ellen Crane is our director. Nicole Cafelda is our assistant director. Um, Ellen writes all the grants and makes sure that everything's getting done. Um, Nicole manages the government record. Aubrey Jaff is our administrative assistant and she also does a lot of the oral histories. Um, does, she does all our social media, so if you are on Facebook, um, you'll see that. Of course, that's me. I schedule this room and um, I do a lot of the research and maintain the vertical files. Um, Harriet and Kara are uh, downstairs and they process all of this information that comes in. So how do we use them? You can come in person, which we love, and it's free. Or you can visit us online. And this is what I'm gonna show you online. You can go to our website. I know. There it goes. So that's what our website. Is there anybody who hasn't been on our website? You can raise your hand. Joe, you've all been on our website? I am so proud of you. Gold stars. I'm gonna have to bring cookies one of these one of these times. All right. So through our website, you can search our collection. Right there, come on. There we go. So this actually goes to, um, to our actual catalog and the company that supplies our catalog. You can look at random photos, which is one of my favorites. It just literally puts up random photos and you can really get sucked down a rabbit hole there because they're really fun. Um, you can uh, fill out a research request. If you live in um, Chicago and you need to do some research on something that you know that we have here, you would fill that in and it comes to our email and I'm the one that answers it. Well, you can search the collections yourself. Put it over there. So you search our collections and what should we look for? You want know, Columbia Gardens? Sure. Columbia Gardens, okay. So it's two words. Come on, we can do it. There we go. It didn't do the quotes. You're supposed to put quotes under there. And we, we kind of want to find pictures. So I'm going to check that little box. This is items with images only. And there we go. 366 results. That's a lot. <laughs> That's how much stuff we have. Um, and you can see they're not all called the Columbia Gardens Collection because like we said, we respected the fonts. So when um, this collection came in, they obviously had something, they had postcards, I remember, because I did that collection. They had postcards of, and photographs of the Columbia Gardens. Um, and Barbara Parker, these collections are actually related. I just know that. Um, view business and school ephemera. So there must be something in there that caused us to tag it as the collection. Gardens. So that gives you an idea of what our website looks like and, and how to find things. Um, and if I, if I didn't check that box, we'd probably have almost twice as many things. We're trying to get an image attached like this to every um, collection. Otherwise, you'll just see our logo right there. Now, we don't scan everything. Some of these, there might be 40 images in there. 
So we might just pick one or two or three that illustrate broadly what is in that collection. And then even from here, you can request an image. So you can go there and go, oh, wow, that's cool. I think that's my house. So you can request an image. Fill in the blanks. Tell us you're not a robot. Submit your request, and it comes to me. And I'll tell you how much it's going to cost. And you say, great, I want 400 of them. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> it cost you $4,000. Um, so super easy. So that's another way to use it. And finally, I'm just going to go to YouTube here. I can go directly to YouTube. So, you know I'm always talking about putting this up on YouTube, right? So this is what YouTube looks like when you go. So you want to search Beauty Archives. That's all you have to do. You don't even have to capitalize this. So we're going to go to the Beauty Archives. And of course that's the search bar. Is it looking? Mm -hmm. Search. There we go. I didn't get it right. So this is the page you're going to get next. And, and you'll find some things there, but you're going to kind of find everything like um, that might be related to Beard Archives, but it might not be like the brown bags, or it might be an article that somebody wrote or recorded about the Beard Archives. So we want you to go to our logo. And there we are. So that's us. And then we really want you to, subs to subscribe here. That tells how many people um, get notified that we've just put a new one on it. So we just want you to hit subscribe and you put in your email and all you get is a notification that the Beat Archives has just posted another video. Um, so these are all our videos. You hit the arrow to get more. I think they go back four years. So these are the last ones. That was Sandmore Maps, Joseph Party, uh, Michael Dwyer. Ooh, he's leading this week with 201 views. Um, this he talked about uh, uh, the Hispanic influence of view and uh, Mike Dennison inside Montana politics. So sometimes I'll put the person's face up there. Sometimes I'll use uh, subject matter just so people can see it. So that's really how easy it is. View the archives, you find our logo, and subscribe, please. And pretty much, I'd say 99% of what's on here is just gonna be the YouTube videos. That's all we do. I think there might be one or two other things where like we made a little movie once. And, um, and that, was, that was it. Um, and I think, I think that's the end. Oh, when you use our stuff, we want you to, ah! <laughs> well, I was going to show you how to credit. End of slideshow, I don't want, oh, can I go back? There, okay. End of slideshow. Um, when you use our, our archives, because you're gonna write the next great book about it, um, we want you to credit it appropriately. Uh, there are different styles. Historians um, prefer the Chicago style, Chicago manual style. So it's a description either of you know, what the resource is. In this case, it's a photograph, photo of Carl Spell. What collection is it in? The C. C. Owen Smithers photograph collection. What item is it? There's the number. Where is it located? at the Butte Super Bowl Public Archives in the city of Butte in the state of Montana. That way, when somebody comes in and they're doing research for Montana resources, and they have this document, and they say, well, it says it's here, and it's um, MC, whatever number that is, MC392, we can pull MC392 and, uh, and pull it out, pull 
whatever collection it was, or photograph it was, to look at it. LHO21. This is um, labor history. So that way people can come in and we can go, oh, well, they found that item or that reference right here or that photograph. So it's always important to tell people where you got it. If you notice in restaurants in town when you see pictures of Butte, look and see who supplied them. There's, I, I guarantee 90% of it's going to come from two places, from the museum or from us. Do you guys, are you guys diligent about making them tag? We are too, because it's probably the same with them. We own those images. We have the copyright on those images. You can't just go willy-nilly and make a really pretty picture for your dentist office or your restaurant or whatever. You have to say, this is where I got that image. Um, and also, I mean, it's polite, and people will ask you, where'd you get that image? So that they can come and get that image. Um, so I think, now I know the tip, because we hit the end of the slideshow. Um, does anybody have any questions for me or Kara about what we do, who we are? And I'm going to put before Debbie sticks out. You can sneak out. I, I told my grandkids I'd take them I know. swimming. Sorry. Go take them swimming. It's the holiday season. In two weeks, Debbie Bermachet is going to be here. And she's going to talk about how she used our facility um, to track down this fascinating story. Um, personal family genealogy story. I won't give you any more of that. So thank you, Debbie. Sorry. See ya. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, so she'll be here next, and that's why when it, that's that's why we're kind of doing a uh, uh, not a tag team, but we put her purposely after our archives 101, so you can kind of see how people like Debbie come in and produce a book and uh, use the geneal genealogy and <coughs> use our resources. I felt like I kind of rambled on. I wasn't as prepared for this as I was for the sample ones. <laughs> yes? yes. Uh, when, when you do the displays like you do now mm -hmm. with the Jewish mm -hmm. community in Butte, is that part of archivist's work, or is this above and beyond what you do? That is above and beyond. Um, that was the result of a grant that we got, very prestigious grant. As, as Ellen, Ellen spent the last year writing grants, and by golly, we got all of them, um, which, which was quite accidental. Um, you don't really think you're going to get all of them, and it kept us very busy. And this grant was from the National Endowment of the Humanities to document um, the ethnicities that we didn't really know a whole lot about. So the Jews were the first one. We held a two-day workshop. And they brought us some things, and they talked, and we had a scholar come in. We repeated that process with the Germans, with the Finns, and with the Mexicans. And uh, so those will be the next three. And that will complete our, um, what are we calling it? All the, all the, not all the world. Oh, all nations. All nations. I was close. <laughs> all nations. Um, really, for the last like seven years, we've done the Norwegians, of course, we've done the Irish, we've done the Italians, we've done, we've done so many, but this one was a grant that uh, we got with the state of Montana as well to do this. And so when you see objects, a lot of time, the information about them comes from our archives, but the actual object we, we might have borrowed. Uh, yes? If you can't, if you're not of the nationality, to go to the workshops, but you want to find out about them. Yes. Um, is that on YouTube? Is that on film or something? Um, those aren't on, well, yes, yeah, some of the lectures we filmed um, when the scholar came in and gave us lectures. So hopefully those will, because we did one of them as a, the Mexican we did as a brown bag. And I'll see if we can put some up, if I were to put the others up. They were a little less formal. So we might do that. And of course, you can come into our vertical files. You can go on our website, type in Irish, and be completely overwhelmed. <laughs> you can, uh, I did find an Icelander once. Um, oh, I should have put our blog post. I even wrote a blog about our Icelander. Um, I think, didn't I? I think I, yeah, I did, because it connects to Keenan jewelry. And then Keenan's, when I walked in to buy my daughter's um, graduation gift, she said, Gosh, I know who you are. You wrote, you're Kim. You wrote that that history of Christie's jewelry. Who was, they were the ones that I think trained Keenan. Keenan worked for Christie, and Christie was from 
I slept. <laughs> so, um, uh, so the archives kind of ties this whole community together. Um, I got two questions for you. All is, You're only allowed one. Yeah, <laughs> just, uh, I'll make it real simple. I only got three words or something. Oh, okay. Um, is the storage, uh, your vault, uh -huh. like bait, is that about full now? Or? Uh, it's fuller than we thought it would be, but we still have a little bit of room left. Um, the vault is two stories. If you, if you haven't had a tour yet. So um, most of the government record is below us, and then behind us over here is the his, historic. That's why we have to be picky about what we take. That's why we have to say, I'm sorry, we only will accept things from Butte, related to Butte um, or Civil Bell. Um, it doesn't mean we're gonna send them off somewhere. Sometimes if it's a valuable resource, we'll say yes. We will take that, identify who it needs to go to, and send it up to them. Uh, we've, I, we finally got some ledgers that we identified as being businesses in Basin in the 1890s. So we sent those up to Clancy, to the museum up there, and they were thrilled. Yes, second question. One last question. Um, what is the most valuable uh, piece of something? Uh, in other to, words, is Define value. Pardon? Historic value or monetary value? No, um, well, I don't know if I could answer that. I think this building is the most yeah, value. Uh, I was not forgetting out of that question. If we had an original U.S. Constitution and so mm -hmm. forth uh, in 1776, well, that there, would certainly be valuable, but we wouldn't have no reason to keep that. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, look how, look how valuable this turned out to be. That's very impressive. Look how, I mean, this, the historical value, I don't know what the monetary value would be. We could probably find out, but we can't give those estimates to people, so. I, I think those first city council minutes are probably pretty valuable. They're probably very valuable. Um, it depends on who's looking at them and who needs them. So, yeah, that's a subjective answer. Jimmy, you have a question. Um, you mentioned the Columbia Bar. Yes. Where was it? Julie? <laughs> it was East Park, the Columbia, Park, yeah. where the dentist built his yeah, office. 249, something like 249 that. 249 East Park, maybe? Kind of across, across a kitty corner from uh, Sparky's, maybe? I think. Mm. I don't know. If anybody has a picture, we would love to have it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have lots of information. If I had a picture, I know where it was. You know where it was. <laughs> Smart Alec. <laughs> do, you know, do you remember anything about it? Have hmm? you heard of the Columbia before? What's that? Have you heard of the Columbia Bar? No, that's what we were just talking about. It might be before their time. No, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, that was a long time if you guys don't remember. We spent a lot of time in bars. I know. I think it was from the teens and twenties. Surgery was the last. Yeah, thirty-three. So was the last. So that was that was before your time. Yeah. We'll we'll let you go. You were running into that one at age six and. You know, <laughs> See, I know all of Jim's stories too. Jim's been a very um, so so. We say we don't collect op collect objects, but Jim has some really cool stuff. So. And they all fit in a little box like this. So swizzle I think there's 60 of them. And this swizzle is, sticks. And swizzle sticks and all kinds of all kinds of really neat little tiny things. So I don't mind those. And postcards, we like those. Yes. Uh, you've seen some of my stuff. Yes. Some of it I want to come up here, but I'm not going to drag it all up here and have you decide. So. Have you decided that that's going to go there? <laughs> <laughs> we know that you're a supporter of the museum as well, so I assume they'll get some of it too, right? Maybe. Uh-oh. <laughs> they got a suitable place. I, 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 they I got a issue. building, by the way. Oh, okay. I know the issue. Yeah. All right. But, uh, but I... I some of the stuff we didn't get into, I have a lot of papers and stuff like that. Papers especially would be very, very interesting. But like I said, I'm not going to bring a little... 
Right. Somebody right. from here would go down there and You yeah. have a, a, a fairly significant and substantial sized collection. So we would probably go down and you know, one of us would go down and say, Yes, yes, you know, yes, we'll take these. And sometimes it's easy enough for us to just go, Okay, well we'll just take all of that. Okay. And then, you know, one of the boxes you can check is if we don't keep it, you, would you like it back? Yeah. And of course, whatever, you know, I don't want you to sell this. And we tell people, we get a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people donating yearbooks. So we have a copy in the library, we have a copy in the vault, and, um, and then whatever goes beyond that, that goes for sale. And we always ask people before they even sign the deed of gift, you know, if we have, you know, multiple copies of what you're giving us, is it okay for us to put it in the garage sale? And like I've said before, you guys see great stuff in the garage sale. We are not selling off big history. We are selling off things that we have three or four or five of. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not getting rid of things in the vault. <laughs> you know, the only thing we would get rid of from the vault would be things that didn't work. Yes? One, one of the other programs that started about nine years ago, Bear Mines and Geology, was, but like what they're talking about is historic preservation of all the, all the mining, coal mining, and be, because geologists have all these maps. Well, what they do is they take them up and it's all digitalized. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can have them back. And mm -hmm. it, it's like we talked about the stove books, like you were about 150. The mining company has 150, but there were 70 of them sitting in the building at the Missoula. Right. Now they're all digitalized. They're on the last group of those books. Yes. And what most people in Butte don't understand is that most people on every this, seven feet on the ground is built from five thousand feet down. It's yeah. all mapped. Uh -huh. Now those will all be preserved. Like uh -huh. you can go up to your mines and geology right now and say, where was the anaconda mine at? And they can pull it up and Google yes. Earth it and it'll show you right where it is. They're looking at our stove books as and, well. Yeah, so we have one. We'll keep the physical copy. Yeah, and then it'll be digitalized. Digitalized because they're more apt to yeah. use. A digital format of that. Um, but papers like you're talking about, they're interested in digitalizing anything about anything about those. Maybe, and we don't digitalize everything we get. That would be um, too costly in terms of staff time. Also, in terms of server space, um, we digitize and we scan on demand. So like all Antonoli stuff is yeah. all digitalized now. Yeah, up there. Up at right, lines. right. Whereas we would scan one thing, and that would that would be it. But if you came in and said, "We, I need scans of all this," that's great. You can do that. Then we can put that scan in our catalog because now we've got it, and it's an archival scanning quality. We just don't have the um, the personnel to do that, which is why we have 60 some odd volunteers doing a lot of our work for us, creating databases so that we don't have to. And what a lot of people don't realize, Google has ruined everything for people like me. Um, not everything is on Google. Google represents about 1% of the world's information. One to 3%. So when you these stuff, you see these images on Google, that's only like less than 3% of really what's out there. The rest of it is it's here. So keep that in mind too. Good to see. Yeah. Any any other questions for me or Kara? Kara can answer some too. Kara's <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Have a happy Thanksgiving. I know it's hard. I'll get it. Thank you. Hi Jim. How are you? Thank you. Good. 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 Good.